Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show and happy Friday. We have an unbelievable pair of stories to begin the day with today involving Democrat cheating to win elections. I was told that never happens. I, what do you mean? I didn't think that was a thing. As it turns out, it's a thing. Um, a pair of cases now involving two states near and dear to my own heart, Connecticut and New York, and the mayor of New York City and the would-be mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut. He is the mayor right now, and he's running in a Democratic primary, and he got caught red-handed cheating. Uh, so says the court who adjudicated his challenger's legal filing. You're not going to believe these stories. And this, as Mayor Eric Adams, a Democrat running New York City right now, finds himself in a whole host of trouble. Here's the headline from the Daily Wire, uh, quoting from the New York Times here. FBI launches criminal probe into whether New York City Mayor Adams received illegal donations from Turkey um, and whether he conspired with a foreign government to receive illegal donations, whether he received illegal foreign campaign contributions and tried to cover it up, uh, while his friend over in Bridgeport decided to stuff ballots into boxes to win a tight Democratic primary. Unbelievable stuff. We're going to get into it with one of our favorites today, Adam Carolla. He's host of The Adam Carolla Show. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This show is supported by Grand Canyon University. Founded in 1949, GCU is a private Christian university that is dedicated to delivering an affordable and transformative higher education. Their vibrant campus is located in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. And according to Niche.com, it's ranked a top 25 best campus in the USA. As of June 2023, GCU is offering 330 academic programs with over 270 online, allowing you the freedom to earn your degree on your time from wherever you are. At GCU, your degree, whether it's a bachelor's, master's, or doctorate, integrates the free market system and a welcoming Christian worldview. Learn more about GCU's programs, competitive tuition rates, and scholarship offers from your own university counselor. They'll become part of the supportive graduation team, taking a personalized approach to helping you achieve your academic goals, walking alongside you every step of the way. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University, private, Christian, affordable. For more info or to enroll, visit gcu.edu. Adam, great to see you. Happy Friday. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. So you've got to listen to this. Uh, I'm going to start with what's happening in Bridgeport, Bridgeport, Connecticut. There is a Democratic mayoral primary underway. There's a guy named Joe G Gannum, and he's the current Bridgeport mayor. He's being challenged by John Gomez. Both Democrats trying to get the Dem nod for the general election for mayor, which happens this Tuesday. Now, the incumbent, Gaiman or G Gannon, forgive me, I'm not in Bridgeport, but Gannon, he was leading, uh, sorry, he was falling behind in the votes to his challenger, Gomez, uh, when it came to the people who voted in person. So the challenger was winning based on the in-person vote. But Gannon weirdly predicted, Adam, the absentee ballots are going to break my way. You just watch. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll wait. Lo and behold, Gammon won the thing, the incumbent, by 251 votes out of 8,173 that were cast. So tight. You know, about 8,200 8, cast, he won by 251 votes. And guess what sealed the deal? The absentee ballots. That secured his margin of victory. This guy, Joe Gannum, happens to be just, FYI, you may find it interesting, an ex-con. Um, what did he do? Was it like a, you know, public urination? I don't know. Was it something like a mild white collar felony? No. He um, served seven years <laughs> in prison for racketeering, extortion, accepting bribes and kickbacks. Well, maybe that was in a job like in the private you know, market and in, in uh, something, you know, the private industry. No, it was as elected. It was as an elected mayor. Back in 1991, he was in office for 12 years. Then he quit when he was caught doing all that bad stuff, served seven years. And then these dumbasses in Bridgeport elected him again. I'm sorry, my fellow Connecticut residents, but that was a dumbass thing to do. He won his old job back and then uh, in 2015 and then four years ago, he won a re-election. <laughs> Shockingly, he's now accused of doing something else illegal. Wait for it, okay? Here's what happened. Gomez, 
the challenger obtained surveillance video showing a woman stuffing what appears to be, I would add, is obviously absentee ballots into an outdoor ballot box days before the primary vote. So this guy Gomez filed a lawsuit against city officials demanding either a new primary or just for him to be declared the winner. Look at this woman. She's, look, you can see, she is putting, if you are not watching this on YouTube, go back later, you can see this woman in her long dress clearly stuffing handfuls, I mean, thick handfuls, her hands are, are wide, widely spread into the ballot box. And we know exactly who it was. It's Wanda Getter Pataki, vice chairwoman of the Bridgeport Democratic Town Committee and a supporter of the incumbent mayor. She was asked to testify in court about whether she did it, whether she supports this incumbent mayor, whether that's her on the tape. And guess what she did? 71 times, she pleaded the fifth. She pleaded the fifth about everything. She doesn't know anything. She now is on leave from her job as a city employee. Wanda Geeter Pataki is seen as follows. Stuffing ballots into the drop box first on the day of the primary at 5.42 a.m. That's when all above board conduct happens, as you know, Adam. You know, if you're just going to innocently deposit your family member's ballots, you go at 5.42 a.m. Then she circles back at 5.43 a.m. One minute later and dumps more, more ballots off. There's so many in her hands, she had to go make two trips. Then, apparently not satisfied with that, 6.38 a.m., she comes back again. She drops a third set of ballots off in the same ballot box. And then 7.17 a.m., a fourth deposit, this time, of ballots she had given to a man. And the man stuffs them in this ballot box. She wasn't the only one. These are the only ones we have on cam. Another woman named Inaida Martinez, a candidate for city council, also asserted her Fifth Amendment rights not to incriminate herself when she was asked whether she took custody of absentee ballots that did not belong to her. So they had a long hearing before Superior Court Judge William Clark and Judge Clark just found, um, I think a day ago, that these call the results of the primary election into serious doubt. They leave the court unable to determine the legitimate result of the primary. The videos, quote, are shocking to the court and should be shocking to all parties. He cited statistics showing the abnormally large numbers of absentee ballots that had been cast in certain voting districts. So it was not just one, uh, it was multiple. And now, as a result of all this, we're proceeding to the general election on Tuesday. The judge says that there should be a new primary, but the general is this Tuesday, Adam. And so these two guys, the accused cheater and the guy who got screwed, Gomez, are going to face off. Gomez is going to appear as an independent, gain him. The incumbent alleged cheater is going to appear on the ticket as the Democratic nominee. And there's a Republican too, David Hertz, who will run. So if the guy who got screwed wins the mayoral race, he's going to abandon this whole thing. If the guy who got screwed loses to the cheating Dem, then he says he's going to enforce the demand for a new primary and the mayoral ship is going to have to take a step back, redo the primary. I don't know what that means for the Republican, but my God. We were told this is an impossibility and that you're a lunatic fringer if you believe things like 2000 Mules, Dinesh D'Souza's film that tries to document suspicious ballot drops in the presidential race of 2020. Not saying it necessarily happened, but it's caught red-handed on camera here in Connecticut. Your reaction? Well, we just need election day. I mean, it's insane that we spread it out. You know, I'm in California. We do ballot harvesting here. There's just no excuse for it because the public is always going to call the election into question if you spread it out over days, weeks, and months, if there's ballot harvesting, if there's all this absentee balloting. It just needs to be election day. And if there's issues with election day, like, well, certain neighborhoods have less precincts and the lines are longer, then let's focus on that. 
But the notion of doing it by mail opens the door to this. And of course, it's going to happen. Look, I think we figured out that politicians are some of the least honest people on the planet and they want to win in any modes, you know, by hook or by crook. So let's not give them options. You know what I mean? Like, let's shrink the window for options for them to cheat. And if you just did election day and maybe you tweak a few things, maybe it's a federal day where no one has to go to work. Maybe you extend the hours. Maybe you have election mobiles that show up mobily into neighborhoods that have less precincts to vote in and let less places to go to. But let's just have election day. And then we could count the ballots that night and we could all go to bed knowing who the president was or who the mayor was. At a minimum, we need to get cameras on every drop box in America. That that should be a bare minimum. OK, you want to do absentee ballots? That's fine. Every single one has to have a camera that is intact and working on Election Day so we can make sure we can just monitor it. That's fine. You want to do it? Great. It's going to be like the ATM camera, your face and your hands and what you're depositing up close and personal so we can check if suspicious things like this happened, um, you know, after the fact. If we get, as this judge found, an unusual ballot dump um, in terms of volume, in particular ballot boxes, that seems pretty straightforward. This We had Dinesh D'Souza on after 2000 Mules came out. And I have to tell you, one of my left-leaning, respectable lawyer friends gave me shit for it. Like, why would you put him on? That's beneath you. It's absurd. That's obviously all a lie. And I know I said, what's your evidence it's a lie? We don't know that it's a lie. Have you gone and checked all those ballot boxes? Have you watched the movie? Of course, he had not watched the movie. Um, And I'll show, if people haven't seen Dinesh D'Souza's 2000 Mules, it does raise some very interesting questions. He doesn't have it red-handed, but he's got a lot of interesting incidents of what looks like nefarious behavior at ballot boxes on on camera. Uh, And here's a soundbite from, from that. Watch it. What you're going to see is he approaches the drop box on his bike. He also has a backpack on. Pull the ballots out of his backpack. Taking his time. Taking his time, digging around, looking for some ballots. Finally gets out, pulls them out. Okay, now I'm set. And he'll put them in. But you also see him get sort of frustrated as he starts to leave, because guess what? At this point, they had started requiring the mules, apparently, to take pictures of the stuffing of the ballots. It appears that that's how they get paid. So they take a picture and stuff it in. They take a picture, not a selfie, but a picture of the the actual ballot going in. But this guy gets frustrated, so he actually has to park his bike, get off. So if you were there just casting your own ballot, what reason in the world would you have to come back and take a picture of the box? So interesting. And yeah, listen, I when I talked to when I talked to Trump, you know, a couple of months ago, whatever, six, whenever it was, I asked him, what's the plan to unrig the next election that you say was rigged in 2020? And he didn't really have one, Adam. And I don't think the Republicans have done all that much since 2020 to shore up election integrity at all. Well, I mean, let's just look at it from 10,000 feet. So, you know, ballot harvesting or stuffing absentee ballot ballots or, uh, ballots or mules or something like that. And and the Democrats go, that's impossible. That never happened. OK, so we're saying conceptually the Democrats aren't capable of trying to cheat a rig an election. Is that what we're saying? Because there's a steel dossier and there's a whole Russian collusion, PP tape, FBI, go after Trump. Hillary Clinton's campaign came up with the Steele dossier and that entire narrative. So is she not capable of doing anything that's untoward or that could possibly cross over and uh, over the threshold of being maybe illegal or tampering with the election? Um, Hunter Biden's laptop, FBI had it months in advance. They knew it was real. You got every single one of those experts from the FBI and the CIA and the security act for 51 of them to sign a document that's saying it had all the earmarks of Russian collusion. So are you guys not capable 
of tampering with an election. You're just so above the fray that you would never lower yourself into doing this. Just let the people vote. We're not going to get involved. I think you've made it quite apparent that you're able to get involved and you're willing to get involved quite a bit. So ballot stuffing is just the sort of mechanical representation of what you're trying to do all the time anyway. I mean, lying, all of you taking the story down, controlling big tech, is that's not all, that's not election tampering. That's the digital version of election tampering. This is just a physical manifestation of it. But of course, if you'd engage in one, you'd happily engage in the other. Right, right. Why is that such a difficult thing to imagine? And for, honestly, the Republicans to start actively working to plot against. You know, I think we're all in the same position as we stand a year out from the next presidential election that we were three years ago. I, very little has changed, and there doesn't seem to be a plan to change much between now and then. So hope you liked the results of the last election because you're probably going to get a lot more just like it. Here is the Mayor Adams story, which is also is not no bueno for him. Um, let me give you the background. He showed up yesterday uh, in New York City, right? It was yesterday, I think. Sorry, in in, um, in D.C. He had an urgent meeting with President Biden yesterday with uh, and some other mayors who are pissed off about the influx of illegal immigrants in their cities. New York, Chicago, L.A., Denver, Houston mayors, all meeting. Of course, what do they want? S more security at the border? No, no. They want f more federal money, to handle the migrants, and they want expedited approval for the illegal migrants to begin working in their cities. You know, it's so ridiculous. I mean, I just, not for nothing, and I realize this is like a rich person's problem, but like, I was talking to my housekeeper, who I love, she's been with me for 13 years, and she came to this country legally, she got a green card, she's been working legally ever since, her husband needed help getting a green card. It took them months and months and months and months, I mean, years, it took them so much money to get him his green card. I helped them out too. It was like, this, this poor guy was trying to jump through the proper hoops so he could work here in the country legally. And now he can. But my point is, they're like, they look at this like, what is this bullshit? These people came in illegally. They didn't check any of the boxes. And now you got all these mayors working to expedite their working permits. For They get rewarded for breaking the law and not doing it the way, you know, people... Who, who did it the right way did. It's just, it's enraging and it's incentivizing to bad behavior. Well, also in terms of solving a problem, look at it this way. You have this porous border and you have all these illegals pouring through the porous border and then they're getting shipped to Chicago and New York and Houston and places that are progressive now who were sanctuary cities, except for not so much, it's all talk. But now they want to know what to do with these people. They need more money for housing and social services, schooling, medical, so on and so forth. But essentially what those mayors are saying is, is we have a leaky ship. Our ship is taking on water. The Republicans are saying we need to patch the side of the ship to stop the water from coming in. That's where it that's where it's emanating from. That's where it's come from. Let's patch it. It's easier to patch it. And the Democrats are saying we need more bilge pumps to pump the water out once it enters the hole of the ship. Yes. Yeah. And I'm exactly. saying, why don't we just patch the side of the ship? And they're <laughs> going, like, there's a no, gaping no. hole. We need to spend 20 times as much with pumps to pump the water back out. That's basically what we're dealing with. It makes perfect sense. So this is amazing. So there they are in D.C. and they're going to meet. And they're asking for an additional five billion in federal funding to ha to help manage the crisis. That's the more than pump. even yeah for the bilge pump, and that's more than Joe Biden even even proposed. He wants sixty billion for Ukraine. He wants fourteen and a half billion for Israel, and he wants four billion to secure our border. Four billion, and not even to secure our border. It's basically for uh, more staff to process the asylum claims. So these guys want five billion. These mayors to help the illegals get jobs and get settled in their cities, uh, and they also want to speed up the uh, adjudication of asylum claims. No one's talking about actually patching up the ship. Um, so there he is. And by the way, just not for nothing, but September 2023 was the highest monthly total ever of illegals crossing the southern border. 
270,000. When I was at Fox, which was only what, seven years ago or so, if they hit 100,000 in migrant crossings, illegal crossings on the Southern border in a month, it was huge. It was 100% gonna be our lead that night. That was a huge number. 270,000 last month alone, or two, September alone. All right, so here's where I get to Mayor Adams. National Review. Uh, okay, weird twist to Adams' planned visit to DC. That's my staff's note to me. Eric Adams cancels White House migrant crisis meetings as FBI raids his top fundraisers. Oh, you can't, you can't make this shit up. All right, so here's his story now. He was in DC for a series of meetings, and then he had to abruptly cancel all of those appointments and return to New York City after the FBI raided the home of Brianna Suggs, a close associate and chief fundraiser of the mayor's. A person with knowledge of the raid on Suggs's Brooklyn home told New York Times, the New York Times that agents from the FBI's public corruption unit questioned Suggs at her home uh, and, at, and, and the home itself was searched. Campaign finance filings show that Suggs has been paid more than 150,000 by Adams since 2021 through her company for campaign consult consulting and fundraising. Uh, the neighbor said, I heard screaming inside the apartment. I heard helicopters as the FBI were searching. That's a big deal. They don't show up to with helicopters if you like haven't paid your taxes on time. The house is now boarded up, says the neighbor. Suggs, a registered, registered lobbyist, was paid by a real estate firm to lobby the mayor's office and the New York City Council in 2022. She worked as an aide to Adams when he was Brooklyn Borough president before he became mayor. Um, and then the mayor's spokesperson, when asked about Adams' sudden departure from the Capitol, said, oh, it was unrelated to the raid of his chief fundraiser. Quote, the mayor is returning to New York City to address a matter. He needs to address a matter, but definitely not that matter. So let me just give you the back piece of it and then I'll give it to you. Now the follow up here, um, New York Times reporting today that this is a criminal public corruption investigation into whether his 2021 election campaign conspired with a foreign government, specifically Turkey, to receive illegal donations. The Times obtained a copy of the search warrant that the FBI used when it raided his top fundraiser's home, Brianna Sugg's home. And the investigation focused on whether the campaign conspired with the Turkish government to receive illegal campaign contributions to get Mayor Adams into office. The FBI sees multiple iPhones and laptops from her house, including numerous documents and other pieces of evidence, including a folder labeled Eric Adams and several contribution card binders Adams has not yet been accused directly of any wrongdoing, but he did immediately cancel all the meetings, as I mentioned. So this is bad. The, the concentric circles of law enforcement are zeroing in. And let me tell you, they don't start with the mayor on an investigation like this. They start with the outside circle and they get closer and closer to him. So that is the other matter, undoubtedly, that he came back for. And it stinks to high heaven, Adam, it stinks. You and I, we're sitting here like a bunch of chumps thinking we can trust the electoral process somewhat, thinking, oh, the guy, you know, I may not be a my, my choice, but he won fair and square, he's in office. Bullshit, this guy may have been taking illegal campaign donations to get the office. The other guy in, in Bridgeport, Connecticut's out there stuffing ballot boxes, so says uh, his opponent, and the judge finds there enough, there's enough evidence for a new election. It's how widespread is it, how bad can we even possibly imagine this might be? Well, I was just sitting here thinking about a New York Post headline for this story, and I think Jive Turkey would be a pretty <laughs> good, pretty good headline for this one. Um, I just now assume it's everywhere, uh, which is which is sad. I mean, how much faith have you lost in our system, whether it be the CDC? or the WHO or the FBI or the CIA, like how much faith have you lost in this in just like the last three and a half years? I was yeah. pretty good at almost everything. If you would have talked to me 10 minutes ago about the CDC, I'd be like, it's a group of experts who understand everything and you should listen to them. 
And I felt that way about most politicians growing up. I felt that way about the system in general. You know, I believe the food pyramid that, you know, I, I was down with all of it. And now <laughs> Good point. I don't believe any, I mean, the food pyramid turned out yes. to be a lot. What, hell, what the hell? They were stuffing us full of bread all day, every day. They were like, don't use butter, use margarine and eat tons of whole grain. Don't touch any protein. Like the exact <laughs> opposite of the truth. It's insane. And I guess mm -hmm. I was thinking about this. I was talking about it on my podcast the other day, which is I was saying, look, at the time the stuff came out, we sort of bought into it. So the food pyramid came out and we're eating seven, seven meals that are seven portions of whole grain every day and just a little bit of protein and using margarine instead of butter and using skim milk instead of whole milk or cream and we bought into it i said at the time we believed in it now you look back at it after 20 years 30 years and you go oh my god they're wrong about everything well just picture moving ahead now 30 years in looking back at the CDC, at Michelle Walensky, at Fauci, at the Hunter Biden laptop, at Joe Biden, never spoke to my son about any business dealings at any time. Just look back and we're going to look back at this time 30 years from now, like we look at the food pyramid now, which is, oh, my God, what were you thinking? They were wrong about everything and they lied about everything. Yes, I saw you. You were you were upset about Nancy Pelosi's daughter, right? Explaining why there's such a divide in the country and how the right half of the country is utterly confused and what they really need to do to better educate themselves. Yes, yeah, I was watching her on Mar um, a couple of weeks ago. and it, But it, it's not just her, it's a sort of common refrain from the more moderate Democrats, where they go, look, the people who disagree with us, they're not bad people. They're hardworking, they're family oriented, maybe they're God fearing, they're patriotic. They're not bad people. They just get fed all this erroneous information. And what they're kind of saying is they're not sophisticated. They don't have college degrees. They're not as smart as we are. And they buy into all these lies. And all we need to do is get them off of their in, their sources of information. They never really say exactly what it is. They're never specific because you could shoot holes in that. They just explain. And it's inferred that people like you or Tucker Carlson or Fox News or Ben Shapiro or even people like me, Joe Rogan, whomever, we may be the people that are peddling these lies. And they go, if we could just move them over from this stream of sort of right wing provocateurs, then they could get the real information and then they would join us. But if you go back just 15 minutes and you look at what the information was, they got it all wrong. They got it all wrong about Hunter Biden's laptop. They got it all wrong about everything. COVID shut the schools, shut the beaches in California, shut the plate play schools, shut the yards, the playgrounds, shut everything down. They got all that wrong. They got everything wrong about the vaccine. At least everything they claimed about the vaccine was wrong. They literally got everything wrong, either by being stupid or by lying. And now after getting everything wrong, and it could be everything from COVID to, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh, he was mm -hmm. a racist who went to mm -hmm. Wisconsin to kill, or the Covington Catholic boy, or George Floyd Jesse, was Jesse Spilett. Spilett. Jesse Spilett. They get everything wrong, and then they have the balls to look into a camera and go, if you just start listening to us, then we could guide you toward the truth. <laughs> it's insane. It's like, it's like some fat nutritionist going, if you just look at the food pyramid, then you'd <laughs> understand. It's like, no, you were wrong. Just yeah. apologize. And by the way, it's insulting for me to go, oh, so if I just watch MSNBC, then I would get everything right about COVID and I would get everything right about Hunter Biden's laptop and I'd get everything right about Jussie Smollett or any, any racial incident that involved a cop in a, in a person of color. Uh, so I'll just watch MSNBC. 
and I'll know everything. Oh, what about the uh, hospital that was bombed by Israel? Remember when Israel fired rockets into that hospital, and killed 500 people in the hospital? I should have got my information from you, MSNBC. So that's what she's saying. And basically, mm -hmm. I realize everything is projection. Everything is projection now. She's literally watching and getting her news from entities that are brainwashing her. And she's saying, come on over and be brainwashed with me. Well, continuing with the theme of Democrats embarrassing themselves um, and cheating inappropriately to get what they want, Sam Bankman-Fried was found guilty by a jury last night. Uh, not a surprise. We've been covering the trial a bit here on the show, but he was found guilty of fraud and conspiracy to commit fraud, seven counts in all. He uh, reportedly did not show much emotion. His parents looked distraught. It only took the jury of nine women and three men four hours of deliberation on Thursday to reach their verdict. They knew. They knew what he had done. It was very clear. The crushing testimony included his ex-girlfriend and the head of his related investment fund, Alameda, which was supposed to be making investments with people's money, but instead they were hemorrhaging dough and they, quote, borrowed money from Sam Bankman-Fried's crypto um, currency line, his, his exchange, FTX, to cover their losses, which is a hard no-no. And Caroline Ellison, who ran the investment firm, testified to it all. She testified, I felt this sense of relief uh, when he had been caught that I didn't have to lie anymore and that I could start taking responsibility even though I felt indescribably bad. Three days on the witness stand. Uh, two other top executives uh, on, on the stand saying similar things about him. It was very clear that they were committing a fraud and they knew it. They knew it. They knew what they were doing was totally illegal. Uh, one year ago, Adam, he was worth, one year ago, think about this. He was worth more than $20 billion. And the absolute darling of the left because he was donating to all of their favorite causes. Here's from Grabian, a mashup of some of what was being said about the guy uh, just a bit over a year ago. Sam Bankman fried is really becoming the industry's lifeline during a crisis lately. I'm fascinated, endlessly fascinated with Sam Bankman frieds role in all of this. You've been now described as the JP Morgan, if you will, of the crypto business. A lot of people called you um, the savior of crypto, the patron saint of crypto, the Michael Jordan of crypto, if you will. Sam Bankman fried Oh, God. Sam Bankman fried the JP Morgan of Freed. SBF, JPM. Do you know SBF? I think it's cool that the guy has just initials, uh, SBF. Some on Twitter calling him the hero right now of the industry. There's comparisons to Warren Buffett back in the financial crisis. Well, he's going to be going to prison for a very long time. He faces over 110 years based on these felonies, but under the federal sentencing guideline, according to most former federal prosecutors, could be actually sentenced, it'll happen in March, from anywhere to 10 to 15 to 30 to 40 years in prison. I mean, it's he's facing serious prison time now in the federal system. It's not gonna be pleasant and he will file an appeal, but it does not look likely he's gonna get out of it. You know who, Sam Banker Free may be the Democrats' uh, darling who's going to prison, but. Second and third are Michael Avenatti and Harvey Weinstein. Those are the two right. other guys that they put up on a pedestal mm -hmm. whose ass they kiss the most. You remember Michael Avenatti when he was going on The View? Oh, I wonder if he's single. They're such <laughs> idiots. First off, they always talk about the rich need to pay their fair share. This guy's all about the money. They're all about the money. They suck up to any money. And they always get the character wrong of these people. I mean, literally, Sam Bankman-Fried, Michael Avenatti, and Weinstein, all in prison. And those were their gods on the left. So maybe you need to recalibrate just a little bit. If you think these people are the best people on the planet and you suck up to them and they all end up being horrible and put into prison, maybe you need a little recalibrating, ladies of The View. Yeah. And you know what else? The members of the press, you know, that was all, those were all journalists I was showing there on CNBC. Where is your skepticism? Where is your natural dislike for people in authority? That's how our profession journalism was built. 
You know, guys who are working class dudes who are shoving dimes into phones to try to get their connections made to spill dirt on corrupt politicians and assholes like Sam Bigman Freed who are taking care of the little guys in too many instances. Where, right? Instead, they just want to, they want access to the power. You know, they want to be part of the crew. Those CNBCers like, oh yeah, look at him. Oh, it's so cool. That you need to have a healthy disdain for the people in power you are covering and their failure to do it, both at CNBC in this instance and across the board when it comes to politicians on both sides is part of the problem that we're facing right now. Well, I think the bigger problem, and you're 100% correct, but what I'm saying is, is you can't choose a side as a journalist. You can't have a healthy disdain for Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis and and while trying to lift up and fluff up people on the left or people associated with people on the left or people who make huge donations to people you're trying to fluff up on the left. That's the problem. The problem is the disparity. If you just fluffed up both sides, well, at least you'd be consistent. But what you're doing is calling yourself a journalist and attacking one side and turning a blind eye or worse to the other side. So you're basically saying what we just got done seeing as a jur- you know, as far as journalists goes, is four years of them attacking Trump for Russian collusion, and then three years of them turning a blind eye to Joe Biden's collusion with the same players, essentially. So you're saying one does exist, except for it didn't exist, and the other doesn't exist, except for it does exist. Mm-hmm. That's the part that makes you a horrible journalist. If you were just agnostic on both of them or you went after both of them with equal energy, then we'd be okay. But you don't do that. You protect one, you attack another. That's the time we're living in. Mm. More with Adam Carolla after this quick break. He's with us for the show today. Don't go away. The brand new Genucel 3 is finally here. It can make your bags and puffiness disappear, along with dark circles, fine lines, crow's feet, and it can firm up your eye contour area. And for the longevity of your skin, this is the first Genucel to provide instant hydrating minerals, so it feels just like a facial at the spa. The new Genucel 3 is included in the Genucel Fall Classics package at a crazy introductory rate. It includes Genucel Jawline Treatment for a firmer neck and jawline, and you get the classic Genucel XV anti-wrinkle moisturizer, as well as the vitamin C deep firming serum. It's like a free spa treatment every day. If you do not look 10 years younger and get compliments everywhere you go, Genucel will give you your money back. Go to genucel.com slash MK60 for deep discounts on this amazing fall package, or just call 800-SKIN-211 now. And for results in 12 hours or less, the immediate effects product is included free. Get ready now for your big Thanksgiving get together. Go to genucel.com slash MK60 right now or call 800 skin 211. G E N U C E L.com slash MK60. Adam, Ron DeSantis in the news for a very weird reason. We talked about it yesterday because, to be honest, I just kind of needed a break from the darkness of the news these past few weeks, and it's a fun silly story about whether he has secret lifts in his boots. And um, there's a follow-up, believe it or not, to this segment that we did. It wasn't our original segment. It was all over. Trump put it out there. And then Politico did a big write-up hiring a fashion writer to actually do the article. And then he brought in three boot experts from across the United States to analyze DeSantis's boots. And why do they, if you look at the boots, here's my hand, they kind of turn up at the end, like where the toe is suggesting that there's no toe in there. Because why? Because his foot is actually like this inside the boot, like like upward, the way a woman's heel would be on a, on a pump. And he's doing this because he's reportedly shorter than the 5'11", he claims, and he wants to look 5'11". So in addition to the two-inch heel he has on the actual boot, you can see from the outside, there's a secret lift from the inside. I'll give you, just in case you weren't watching, a flavor of how this has been going down in the media. Will Kane, who we love um, over from Fox News, he did a bit on DeSantis's boots, and he's a DeSantis fan, but here's what he said on it in SOT 25. 
And this one is about a one and a quarter inch heel. Ron DeSantis' external heel looks a little bit bigger than this heel. That's fine. You want a little bit higher external heel? That's fine. The question is, is he got a lift inside designed to give him another two inches? So that, again, if you're listening instead of watching, I'm drawing a line, a diagonal line from where the heel of the boot meets the instep up towards the back of the heel, right? To lift you up another couple of inches. Your big toe knuckle, it it should hit about right here. DeSantis's looks like it's hitting about back here. Way back about the middle of the boot. Not the right place for a knuckle unless you were lifting it up into an extreme diagonal. Ron DeSantis's toes aren't going up toward the front of his boot. And they're not because (laughs) he's lifting it up at an extreme diagonal from an internal lift. Verdict? Yes. Ron DeSantis is wearing lifts. Mm, Okay, so that's his take on it. I'll show you the boots. We'll show you the video where he's walking a little strange V7, where he's like walking across the stage. It doesn't look like a normal walk, Adam. I'm going to be honest. I don't see, I don't know men who walk like this. I like Ron DeSantis, but it's a weird, can we see this? Yeah, look, it's just sort of an odd little, I'm not sure what's happening there. It does look a little bit like a woman who's learning how to walk on heels. I'm not going to lie. Like the governor would vote for him, but mm, something going on there. And then, then Josh Holmes of the Ruthless podcast was here yesterday with Tom Bevan of Real Clear Politics. And Josh Holmes, who's a political consultant, his job, day job is to like advise people on how to get elected, Republicans. And here's, because DeSantis originally said something like, this is a ridiculous controversy. This paper, Politico, or whoever's writing about this isn't worth anything other than like birdcage liner. He was a little bit more articulate than that in their defense. And Josh Holmes came on the program yesterday and had some advice for the governor on how to handle this. And one of the reasons I've been sort of bearish on where DeSantis's campaign is with an awful lot of this stuff is that they have some sensitivity to doing that back, certainly to Donald Trump. And when you have one side that is willing to deploy every tactic in the book and get the national conversation about whether he's wearing lifts, and you're not willing to say, like, I'm going to take my lift and shove it up your fat ass. Like, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a one-sided discussion. Like, you can never get out of it. Come out on the next debate stage on stilts or something. You know? I mean, just make a whole, the whole thing a clown show out of it. I'm sure people would love that. Well, guess what happened? It wasn't that quote exactly, but DeSantis went on Newsmax, I think with our pal Eric Bowling, and look what he said last night. This is no time for foot fetishes. We've got serious problems as a country. You know, if Donald Trump can summon the balls to show up to the debate, I'll wear a boot on my head. This is a time for substance. This is a time for us to debate the issues that matter to the American people. He said balls. He's getting serious. (laughs) So what do you make of Bootgate and whether it's, uh, why are we talking about it? Why are so many people interested in it? Well, first off, full disclosure, I'm wearing Spanx and a push-up bra right now. You're my man. <laughs> so I just don't want to get, you know, fragged online. Too as judgy. Being a hypocrite. Um, okay. It definitely seems like he's got something in there. Forget about what's in the boot. Choosing to wear cowboy boots in general is 99% short guys trying to get a couple of extra inches just in their shoe because Mm -hmm. if you just wear flat dress shoes whatever you don't get as much you know sylvester stallone is a short guy he's always wearing boots everywhere boots are uncomfortable they're not great for walking around and the really the only reason if you did some sort of boot survey you'd find that 86 percent of boot wearing was done by guys under six foot and almost zero was done by guys over Six oh, that's foot. so interesting. So, I did not know that. I mean, you're accepting, I assume, actual cowboys and people who work on ranches and with horses where it's what you must wear. Yes, I'm I'm going to back out actual cowboys and certain members of gay parades. The rest, <laughs> the rest of us would wear I'm short. Six two, and I don't wear cowboy boots. Cowboy boots are uncomfortable to walk around in. They are and uncomfortable. You only do it if you needed the height. Like I did radio many years ago with Danny Bonaducci from the Partridge family. He was a short guy. He wore cowboy boots every day 
I wore tennis shoes every day. But if I were the short guy, I'd probably wear cowboy boots. And if he was the mm -hmm. tall guy, he'd be wearing tennis shoes. So just the presence of cowboy boots suggests a little Napoleon situation Red going flag. on there. Got it. Well, I didn't know anything about the boot lift controversy. I was just watching DeSantis wearing cowboy boots in, in a suit. And I, I, I didn't know anything about the list. I just thought, well, that's an odd choice. Cowboy boots in a suit. But maybe he's in Wyoming talking to ranchers or something like that. He's he's not. He's from, you know, he he's in Florida. Obviously, Florida isn't Houston. It's not Wyoming. You, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, where do. did the cowboy boots come from in the first place? You choose to wear cowboy boots when you have issues about your height. Now, if you want to add a second story to your cowboy boots, well, that's maybe what he did. But the fact that he even chooses to wear cowboy boots suggests to me that height is an issue for him. That being said, who cares? Yeah, I would yeah. much rather have a 5'5 Joe Biden who knew what the fuck he was doing than a 6'9 <laughs> Joe Biden who's acts how he acts today. <laughs> Exactly. Either Ron DeSantis at worst, and not that it's bad to be shorter, but at worst is five foot nine. And he should be like, hello, I served in the Navy JAG Corps. Suck it. Five nine. I went over to Iraq. I realize he wasn't on the front lines, but obviously he's a guy with courage who served his country. on. Who gives a shit how tall he is? But he cares if this is true. And I guess it just is a window into a certain level of vanity or insecurity which is probably present in most of our politicians. You're gonna say Barack Obama was an incredibly vain and insecure. I don't believe it. Trump too, you know, he's always got like the hair has to be just right. He's going to a tanning bed for God's sake. Um, I don't know. I think it's a common trait amongst our politicians, in particular, the presidential candidates. No, I agree. And I think, well, first off, I mean, DeSantis isn't wrong when they do those surveys of like fortune 500 ceos you know 95 percent of them are over six foot tall so there is an actual sort of baked in bias if you mm -hmm. asked a kid and showed him a picture of a tall person and a short person you said who would you like running this country 95 percent of them would pick the tall person so there is some That's math so to it but i think what we're all what we're all responding to is him lying about it. That's the thing that we're responding to, not the trying to get an extra inch and five eighths. It's more like, are you trying to fool us and are you trying to deceive us? Because we're just coming off a guy, certainly in Biden, Hillary Clinton, and a lot of people think this way about Trump, where they were trying to deceive us for the last X amount of years. I wonder if. I, I'm sure somebody has asked Trump whether he goes in the tanning bed, you know, regularly. He clearly does. But I wonder if somebody's asked him. Maybe we can Google it. I will tell you, I sat across from Trump in 2010 and asked him directly, is that a comb over? Is your hair, is your hair a comb over? Is, there, is it a ball spot? And he's like, no, it's all real. And he offered for me to feel his hair and mess it up and stick my hands inside the hair, which I did. We'll lay the tape in later. I did. I stuck my hand right up in there, Adam. And it was all real. And it was not a comb over. It was legit. Ron DeSantis had a, he had an opportunity to say, F this boot gate thing. I'm taking off my boot right now. Look inside my boot. Nothing in there. No lift. Nothing but a regular sold bottom. But I think what we're learning here is that men do with their height what women do with their weight or their age, right? Falsely play with yeah. the numbers to make themselves feel or sound better. Well, I would also say, Megan, with all due respect, um, you don't have to ask a guy in Donald Trump who plays 70 rounds of golf a day in Florida if he goes to a tanning salon. <laughs> but he maintains it year round, Adam, No, even in New York, where it is gray for nine months of the year. OK. <laughs> well, true. Look, uh, I, I, it's got to be spray on at this point as well. Yes, it could be spray on. Uh, I've done the spray yeah. on. The spray on does look a little orange, like, you know, Trump is yeah. famous or infamous for being. Spray on is self tan always goes wrong. That's what Doug always says. He'll be like, what's that huge streak on you? And I'll say self tan gone wrong. 
And he'll say, does self-tan ever go right? And I say, not really, no, but you know, sometimes you gotta be, you gotta have a little color to your skin, especially in those summer months. I'm glad that we're covering well, all the important news of the day. To you and, and Doug, when self-tan goes right, you don't know it. You know what exactly. I mean? It's not apparent. You, it's like guys who think they have gaydar. I can tell when someone's gay. Well, you can tell the ones you can tell, but you don't know the other 10 guys. You know, it's like at the border, like the getaways. Like we got, we captured 200 tons of fentanyl this year. That's great. Now, how much got through? That's Wait, now hold that thought because I really want to hear how your gaydar works right after these messages. (laughs) Don't go away. Well, like many folks, I am trying, trying so hard sometimes, but I'm trying to eat healthier these days. And that is why I love good olive oil. It makes such a difference if it is good. And by good, I mean fresh. So olive oil packs the most flavor and the most nutrients and the healthiest stuff when it's fresh from the farm. That's the problem with supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can sit on the shelf for many months growing stale. This is why I like my olive oil direct from small award-winning farms thanks to a guy named TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. When I tasted TJ's farm fresh oils, I fell in love with their vibrant, grassy, delicious flavors. They taste so good on salad, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. And as an introduction to his fresh pressed olive oil club, TJ is willing to send you a full sized bottle worth $39 of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils for just $1 to help him cover shipping. Best of all, there's never a commitment to buy anything, and you can cancel your membership at any time. Get your free $39 bottle for just $1 in shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to harvestfreshnow.com. That's harvestfreshnow.com for a free bottle and pay just $1 in shipping. Harvestfreshnow.com. So, Adam, if you can, spare a tear for Hunter Biden now may be the time to do so. He's very sad that the mean, awful press corps has, quote, vilified his addiction. They vilified his addiction. In a piece in USA Today, he talks about how his struggles and mistakes have been the fodder for a vile and sustained disinformation campaign against him uh, and his dad and an all-out annihilation of my reputation. (laughs) <laughs> such as it was. Uh, he goes on to say, look, I'm, I'm not a victim, but what troubles me is the demonization of addiction, of human frailty, using me as its avatar and the devastating consequences it has for the millions struggling with addiction, desperate for a way out and being bombarded by the denigrating and near constant coverage of me and my addiction on Fox News and in the New York Post. So that's what he's worried about, what what coverage of his troubles is going to mean for other addicts who he thinks are looking at him thinking, you know what, Fox News and the New York Post are going to come for me next. Well, first off, as long as the other addicts aren't embezzling millions of dollars from (laughs) Ukraine and China and Russia (laughs) and all the worst dictators in the world, then they shouldn't have an issue. Like if they're not (laughs) using their dad's name to enrich themselves and they're just strung out on heroin, then they can go see Dr. Drew and they should be fine. So they can avoid this kind of scrutiny by not being an international embezzler. So just a tip (laughs) to all the people struggling with drugs, you can avoid this by just being a junkie. But you can't be an international thief and a junkie, because then you will not be able to avoid this scrutiny. So that's- You went too far. You went too far. Number two, he's, okay, this is, this is right out of the playbook. I have seen hours and hours and hours of coverage of Hunter Biden as it pertains to this issue. And every single commentator I've ever heard speak about it on Fox or beyond makes sure and is very careful to start with he's an addict i have sympathy for him i have addicts in my family this is not what we're talking about we're talking about embezzling money we're talking about pay for play we're talking about 10 percent for the big guy 
It's not 10% of his cocaine. It's 10% of his money for the big guy who's now president of the United States and was vice president of the United States. So he is hiding behind this. And it's a common tactic. And it's what Democrats do all the time. You know, God forbid you have some problem with any member of the squad. Oh, it's because we're people of color. Oh, because it's, we're gay. No, you're anti-Semite bitches. That's why we don't like you. <laughs> right. That's what we're seeing time after time after time in this in this crazy reaction to Israel. I mean, have you been following the insanity on college campuses, these lunatics exposing themselves for the rabid anti-Semites they are? Well, it's it's insane. And I was saying on my podcast the other day, like, do this thought experiment. What if we just went back to the year 2000? And I said there was a horrible event where Hamas came into Israel and butchered babies and raped people and slaughtered people and then took hostages back to their caves in Palestine. Um, and then so some concerned college students and concerned citizens here in the U.S. started putting pictures of those taken hostage, women, children, and posting them up in the town square or the student union or Brooklyn or Manhattan. And then a group of people showed up and started tearing down those pictures. Who would that group be? If you ask me that in the year 2000, who's the group who tore down the pictures of the missing children and the missing women who are abducted? I would go, the Klan, I guess the Klan. And you'd go, no, it wasn't the Klan. Oh, well then some kind of right wing Republican religious nut jobs or some Christians or something? No, no, it's progressive women from the left. I'd be like, what? Right? You gotta be kidding. No way. No, these are 19 and 20 year old left leaning progressive women on the, on the left, college students mainly. I'd be coming, they're tearing down pictures of missing kids who are being tortured by Hamas right now? What are you talking about? No, this is the work of the Klan. No, this, this is progressive women. Well, and you, go, you're the perfect person to ask about this. You starred in the movie, No Safe Spaces, made by our pal Mark Joseph, which I absolutely love, and was calling attention to the campus insanity years ago. We talked about this when we first launched the show with you guys. And we're all over these college campuses getting canceled and people having over the top reactions to your mere presence there. And those very same people seem to have zero problem with murdered babies, beheadings, rapes that led to torture and then murder. Eh, it's called resistance. You really need to contextualize it is what we're hearing from them now. Well, what they won't admit, and I, I think there's a large populace in this country who just wants chaos. I, I really think they just want the opposite of whatever's right and whatever order would be, whatever your version of order. Like you go, can't we just have a robust border? Why can't we have a robust border? Oh, it's more complicated than that. It's not more complicated than that. They never give an alternative plan, right? It's just sort of chaos. It's just defund the police. Okay. And then do what? I don't know. They're sort of merchants of chaos. And it's essentially, I was talking to someone about this in the green room of a comedy club last night I was at. And I said, at a certain point, it just feels like the opposite of whatever a good civilization and a good citizen would do. And I said, it's as if I was at the supermarket and they had one of these big displays, a big pyramid of oranges, and somebody pulled one out and they all toppled down and fell on the floor. And so me and a couple other decent citizens started to pick them up and put them back on the shelf. And then these people started coming by and kicking the oranges and throwing them away. And you were saying, hold on, what are you doing? And they said, hey, I want order just like you do. And I went, oh, OK, mm -hmm. well, then let's all work together to put these things back up on the shelf. And you kicked one again and went rolling underneath the counter and you threw one that way. And I was like, wait a minute, are you helping here? And they went, I want the same thing you want. 
But do you? Do you want order? Do you want these oranges back up on the shelf? And if you do, then why are you kicking them and throwing them the other direction and knocking them over every time I pile them back up on the shelf? At a certain point, I think you just want chaos. Yeah. That, this reminds me of a story happening out in California by you in LA where a young woman was walking down the street and she got sexually assaulted. It was an obvious attempted rape of this woman in broad daylight. Absolutely disgusting. This is from um, CBS News and ABC7, where this woman is walking down um, a Long Beach, California sidewalk and she's gone public, so we'll say her name because she's saying it publicly. Rebecca Peterson is her name. Look, we have the video. Look at this. This man comes up behind her. He's homeless. He's pulling down his pants and he grabs her. He's exposed and tries to rub himself up against her. She falls over. And then this good Samaritan there, this is so gross. We had to blur his crotch because you know his unit is out. He's right before the sexual assault. So this good Samaritan, Dan McIntyre, saw it happen. It was a 30-year-old um, perpetrator and a young woman um, and ran over. He said the guy looked demon possessed. He approached her from behind, lifted up her skirt and rubbed his genitals against her, then shoved her to the ground. That guy McIntyre pulled out a canister of pepper spray, God bless, and then chased the perp away from the scene. It's bad enough we're seeing attempted rapes literally in broad daylight on the street as a woman's just walking. But what would happen in any sane city that wasn't committed to chaos. What would happen would be the police would go after him with the full measure of the law. Instead, the LA County District Attorney's Office reviewed the case and really didn't see any felony charges here. It's really, no, we're gonna decline to file any felony charges whatsoever. And the victim was absolutely outraged. So she went to the city prosecutor's office. They took over and filed the maximum charge they were capable of doing within their jurisdiction was misdemeanor, count of sexual battery. That's as much as they could do. Now those city prosecutors are going back again to the LA district attorney's office, George Gascon, saying, would you please reconsider charging this as a felony? It's on tape. You don't even have to take her word or the eyewitness's word for it, but it is chaos, Adam, just as you said. Yeah, well, and also how else could it go? And then also, if you really think about the mindset of the people that are doing this, first off, they are beat out of their brains on drugs or they're psychotic or they're both. And obviously it speaks to a bigger problem. I had Gavin Newsom on my podcast 10 years ago, and I told that idiot, the biggest problem with the homelessness is drugs and mental issues. Those are the two biggest problems. And he said to me that homelessness was his key issue and that literally verbatim, I quote him, nobody cared more about the homeless issue than he did. Um, and then he went to explain to me the real face of homelessness, the true face of homelessness. And you guys can look this up. It's on YouTube. It's easy to find. I've seen it. I'm not exaggerating. He said the true face of homelessness was a mother of two who was recently divorced, who had a full time minimum wage job and couldn't make ends meet. That was the real face of homelessness. Now, of course, no human being has ever seen a mother of two out there wearing a Taco Bell outfit. It's all <laughs> males, some females all junkies and everything to do with mental illness. So he's trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. If the problem was sober women who are mothers of two who are recently divorced, we have all the resources in the world for those people. But that's not who the problem is. And if you really think about just sort of democratic lives, like you look at it this way, Gavin Newsom says the real face of homeless is mothers of two and AOC says the people that are looting the stores are mothers who have hungry children who just want a loaf of bread. Have you ever seen anyone steal a loaf of bread and all the thousands of hours of mobs and looting and rioting that has gone on? I've never seen a Panera. The only raid. time I've ever seen that happen in New York is when I went to see Lim is. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's it. 
It doesn't happen. It's ridiculous. And it's really endangering people in these massive cities. I'm not for nothing, but Gascon, you know, RDA, the Philadelphia, the Chicago, these all these guys get Soros funding uh, when they're running for office and then they get in office and Soros doesn't have to live near the resulting crime when they ro- won't enforce the criminal uh, code. And just yesterday we were covering this bearded lady, we were calling him. It's a guy, that's why he has a beard. And he's posing as a woman, as a rabbi who stood up and confronted Joe Biden at this fundraiser he was speaking at saying, there needs to be a ceasefire. So it's a man pretending to be a woman and it appears to be um, a, a Jewish person pretending to care about Jewish people, but really doesn't seem to, who stands up at this thing to say, there has to be a ceasefire now, which everybody knows would lead to the annihilation of Jewish people because Hamas is not gonna stop. Hamas has made very clear that they're gonna keep on going until Israel doesn't exist anymore. So you do, it is amazing how many fingerprints you see of George Soros on our nation's problem. And in that case, it was this woman was funded by George Soros' son, uh, who was affiliated with her in some meaningful way. But there are people who are actively sowing the chaos of which you speak. And there, I, who is the Republican counter to that? Like, who's the deep-pocketed Republican who's making sure sane DAs get elected? so that we can prosecute crime. And sane homelessness approaches and policies are put into place so we don't have to walk through tent cities to get to the bus stop. Yeah, the problem is, is whether it's a roommate who wants chaos or whether it's a DA who wants chaos in your city, as the sane roommate, you can never you can never never sufficiently battle them because you're the one who's going off to work, who is paying your bills, who's washing your dishes. And anyone who's had a crazy roommate knows they always win. Your only choice is to move out. You can't fix them. Like you just have to leave California. You can't fix California because California is crazy. Newsom is crazy. All the mayors, the DAs, the city council, like everybody, is just crazy. There's no fixing crazy. There, you know, we have in LA, our legislator, they're like, they're blaming, you know, when all the catalytic converters were being stolen, they blame Toyota for making it too easy to steal the catalytic converters, yes. not the thieves that are stealing catalytic converters. If you're gonna be guided or governed by that kind of crazy, then you just have to move. That's an insane roommate. That's terrifying. Yeah, we did cover that story. Speaking of Gavin Newsom, he's out there trying to rewrite his COVID history, truly one of the worst in the nation, possibly the worst on the lockdowns about which you were very public. And he's doing two things, saying we did way better than we did poorly. We had way more successes than we had mistakes. And by the way, anything you don't like was the result of local government in California. Not me, it wasn't me. Here's a flavor of an interview he gave with Fox 11 anchor, uh, Elix Michelson in SOT 10. What do you think was the biggest lesson learned in terms of what we did wrong that maybe you would do differently the next time around? I'm not consumed by what we did wrong. I'm consumed a little bit more by what we did right. I mean, we led the nation in terms of, I mean, there's no large state that outperformed California. On a per capita basis, the number of people lost their lives in California is substantially lower in places like Texas and Florida. We had less learning loss than states like Florida and elsewhere. So we outperformed the rest of the nation in that respect. At the time, we didn't know what we didn't know. And we're experts, we're geniuses. In hindsight, though, we have a report that we're looking forward to publishing on areas where we could have proved to substantively answer that question, not emotionally answer that question, through an objective lens, not a partisan lens. Oh my Lord. Let me just give you the second defense because it speaks to how it, anything you didn't like, that was me. The school closures, that was those asshole local mayor, local mayors. I ceded all control to them. Listen. Schools shut down too long. I mean, in certain parts of the state, in certain parts of the state, they were open. Yeah. Uh, and they, we gave local control. The local control funding formula, it's a constitutional construct. It allows localism. And we advanced localism. We didn't have command and control. We allowed that local control. And in some cases, it was, yes, they waited too long. In other cases, they didn't. It's an interesting fact, isn't it, that states like Florida are out there saying we got we opened up earlier, and yet they did worse mm-hmm. in academic achievement. Yes, I think come out of this with a sense of humility, absolutely, but also a little grace 
uh, that California tended to do a little bit better uh, than most other states. I mean, like literally yeah. every word of that was a lie. Yes, total revisionist history. Well, let's just think about it. So you're saying states where they shut schools down and kept kids at home, like California, the kids did better academically at home than they did in states that were free that did not close the schools? Well, in that case, why are kids at school right now? Why not just shut all mm -hmm. the schools so they can stay home and get more learning in than states that let the kids go to school? Because that's essentially what he's saying. I know he can't do math, and I know we don't keep track of math scores in California, but if you're doing the math, you're saying, okay, so the longer and the harder you lock down, the more the kids flourish academically. That's number one. Number two, this guy is a goddamn sociopath. I talked to him. I stared into the eye of the beast for an hour and a half on my podcast. And all he does is lie. He's slip, he's, he like, puts brill cream on his teeth. I don't know why more idiots don't understand who this guy is. I lived in California. They shut down the beaches. They arrested people for paddle boarding in the harbor. They shut down all the beach volleyball courts. By the way, being outdoors, vitamin D, exercise, sunshine could have been the best thing for you during COVID. But no, he locked them all up in their apartments. This guy's a sociopathic, tyrannical dictator, and nobody should listen to a goddamn word this idiot says. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. The he's numbers are actually... Sociopath. He's a liar. And by the way, he didn't believe COVID for 10 minutes. He was out eating, yep. and I think you can check the timeline. When he was at the French Laundry, which is the most expensive place you can eat, in California, with 28 of his closest friends, arm in arm, banging elbows, no mask, eating indoors. The following week, he shut down outdoor dining based on zero science in California. Zero mm. science. He never and believed in COVID. He did. He did want school lockdowns. And at the same time, he was pushing them for everyone else's kids. He sent his four kids to private school, which was open. So his kids got to go to school while he kept all the other kids who are going to public school in California away from their teachers, away from in-person learning, which we know uh, was, was of course, better for the children to be in school. So he, it's, of course, a double standard. Well, and the teachers' unions are in the back pocket of the Democrats, and they're going to dictate to the Democrats what they want and the teachers unions are corrupt and they're cowards. And so they just wanted to stay home. So they just told all the Democrats who were in charge of California or Chicago or wherever they happen to be in charge, uh, we're staying home and we want to stay home. Who doesn't want to stay home? But Gavin Newsom's revisionist history on his tyrannical COVID lockdowns are insane. And by the way, why do revisionist history if you were right? If you were so much better than Florida, if you're so much better than Texas, then why do you need to go back and tweak the past? Just tell us what you did. And by the way, it's insulting for anyone who lived in California because they saw the schools close. They saw the playgrounds close. They saw the churches close. They saw the beaches close. I mean, these guys are sociopaths. I saw Eric Swalwell on a news show about three weeks ago. And he's like, the Democrats? Well, let me tell you about the Democrats. We're the party that if some airborne virus sweeps the land, we're the ones who are trying to open Main Street, open schools, open churches. Like, oh my God. Said, churches and schools. You're the ones or you're the ones who locked everyone down and got everyone addicted to fentanyl and suicidal for a year and a half. You jackass. That's exactly what Gavin Newsom did. We've covered at, yes. at length his shutdown of the churches there and how he was on them. He got federal help and sniffing them out underground uh, investigators inside churches to see if people were wearing their masks and keeping social distancing. The feds are still going after some of them. Bill Malugin of Fox News tweeted out a reaction saying, this guy repeatedly shut down California businesses in 20 and 21. He issued stay at home orders. By the way, he definitely issued mask mandates and vaccine mandates for all the schools, which he did close. 
And he's doing something similar to what we saw Andrew Cuomo do, um, who's also trying to wiggle out of his authoritarian streak during COVID, which is yeah. they're saying, well, I didn't order them closed. Yeah, I, I left it to the locals. What they did was issue these, quote, like color-coded tiers that decided who could open and who couldn't, and then stayed in the red the entire time and and got on the schools who didn't listen. That's, of course, what he was doing. Um, and then, of course, sent his own kids to in-person learning at private school while the public schools in Sacramento County or all around him remained closed. Overnight curfews, closing of the businesses and so on. Obviously, though, he's running for office. There's zero chance for him to be doing this revisionist history if this guy were not running for office. And I don't care. We'll see how he manages to get Joe Biden off the ballot. Right now, RFK is polling at 22% of the Democrat Party, like 22%. So good luck getting him out of the way. Uh, I don't think there's some love affair for Gavin Newsom that's being tamped down right. I really don't. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe they're more progressive than I realize. But I think, you know, old school liberals are not in love with the crazy ass far left progressive policies that Gavin Newsom has forced on Californians. And once they get a close look at that guy, I think they'll go rushing to RFK, Jake. They'll rush anywhere other than Gavin Newsom. Maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? Well, I think COVID let us see everyone for who they were and what they wanted. The same way as Israel and Hamas and Palestine. We're now getting to see who people really are, if you know what I mean. Like you're going, oh my mm -hmm. God, these people are really showing their hands. Um, Gavin Newsom, Gretchen Whitmore, many of these people, certain Lori Lightfoot, many, many on the left jumped at the opportunity to seize control over their populace. And they did it immediately, which meant they wanted to do it all along. Now, show me Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis showed us who he was as well. He did not want to do this. So what Gavin Newsom showed me was let's just say you thought to yourself, um, I'm gonna have a, a, a fire drill at my house. Um, I'm not gonna tell my wife, I'm just gonna see how she reacts when I set the smoke detector <laughs> off. And you did a fire drill and you set the smoke detector off and your wife ran upstairs, grabbed her jewelry box, ran downstairs, knocked over one of the kids, pushed away the other kid who was standing in front of the door, ran out the front door and slammed it shut behind her. And then you thought, well, that was just a drill, but <laughs> I at least know who this woman is now. I learned something. She didn't gather the kids together. She didn't say, you go first, I'll stay here. She didn't run for the box of baking soda or the fire extinguisher. I got to see who she was. And COVID was a fire drill for Gavin Newsom. I get to see who this jackass is. His first impulse is to shut everything down. And by the way, he'll go to SoFi Stadium, take a picture with Magic Johnson and not wear a mask. That's no problem. But he'd like you arrested if you don't wear your mask. Okay, I got to see who he is. Exactly right. And in his state, one of the other lunacies they're pursuing, your state too, is this idea of reparations, which they're still pushing in San Francisco and statewide. And there was such an illuminating clip circulating online this week. I don't know if you saw it, but for some reason, the former star soccer player, Abby Wambach, was interviewing this woman. We looked up her name. It is Dr. Yaba Blay, who describes herself as a scholar, activist, public speaker, cultural consultant whose scholarship work and practice centers on the lived experiences of black women and girls with a particular focus on identity, body politics, and beauty practices. You know where this is going. So Dr. Yaba Blay gives an interview to Abby Wambach, whose conduct in this clip is equally, if not more appalling than that of Dr. Blay. But Dr. Blay gives up the whole reparations game for these guilt-ridden, woke progressives who think they're gonna buy their way out of their white guilt, uh, it's a no. Here's the clip. White people, I need you to know that your money will not assuage you from your guilt. You cannot pay your way out of this. There aren't enough reparations in the world that you can pay us. 
And so you think because you write a check or you slide me something in Venmo that you're absolved and you can tell somebody, well, I gave Dr. Blay $100. I'm not racist. Dr. Blay is going to spend your $100 and still tell you that you're racist. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We don't feel guilty and we're not giving you any money, Dr. Blay. Go out and earn it yourself. Take care. Well, to be fair to Abby, the soccer player, she would just do that. Like if Dr. Blay was like, we should take all white cats and throw them in wood chippers and take black <laughs> cats and give them castles. She would have been like, oh, yeah, mm, mm, yeah. Right yeah. on. I mean, she, she could have said, I rode a unicorn here in the studio. And uh, sometimes when I make a number two, there's just gold ingots in the toilet. And Abby would have been like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, right, right. And in Lord of the Rings, that was a documentary. That wasn't a film. That was a real thing that happened. And she, Abby would have went, yeah, no, yeah, right, yeah, right. Because nobody can push back against these idiots. I mean, just like the idiot that interviewed Gavin Newsom. You know, it's just like, oh, okay, Florida did a lot worse than we did, but everyone's moving to Florida because it's so bad and everyone's leaving California and going to Texas. So you picked out Texas and Florida as the two places that did worse than California. Then why is everyone leaving California, idiot? What is it so that weird. they don't know that you know? Yeah. People well, are this doing some goddamn interviews. That's what I'm saying. Stop nodding your head at all the BS and lies and hate speech. Just uh-huh, uh-huh. Don't do it. Start pushing yeah. back. Do some interviews. Right. Right. Uh, That's it, why it's a lost art. And, yes. and in particular, when it's, and, you know, I don't know this reporter, but like when, you know, you need ongoing access, if you're a lefty interviewing a lefty politician, if you're a lefty star soccer player interviewing somebody who's lecturing you on race and you have the sin of the original sin of being white, grow a pair. All right. Grow a pair. You're going to have to be a big girl and push back on that nonsense. Doctor, you're not getting my money. I don't feel bad for you at all. I feel zero reason to atone for anyone's sins hundreds of years ago. Get off your high fucking horse and get a real job. She right now does some sort of whatever wokeism work that, of course, CNN turned into a documentary. You need my hundred dollars after that? Well, you're not getting it. That's the kind of interview I would like to have with her. Maybe she'll come on the show, Adam. We could have like a sit down, the three oh, of us, no, and go we'll, over. We'll never come. <laughs> They'll never come on the show. They're always cowards. They only go where the getting's good. And, and here's how I know that. Remember during COVID when the big problem, according to the left and Biden and Fauci and Rochelle Walensky, the big problem was that the Fox viewers and the MAGA people and the Trump supporters weren't getting vaccinated. Those are the people they had to get through the message to, right? And they would say it all the time. This is a problem of the unvaccinated. And who are the unvaccinated? They are the people who watch Fox News, right? Okay. Well, then Fauci, why are you going on MSNBC for 55th time this month? Why are you talking to Rachel Maddow for the 28th day in a row? Why don't you head over to Fox? You know, the number one show on Fox was at the time, Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, they outrate all of these shows on CNN and MSNBC. Why not just head over there and get the message out over there to a bigger audience who is the audience that you've decided is not being vaccinated? When you go on Joy Reid show, you're talking to a bunch of triple vaccinated idiots. Why not head over to Fox where all the people aren't being vaccinated and talk to their flock? But did he ever show up on Fox? No. Why not? He's a man of science. He is the science. So go ahead, Mr. Science, go on Fox because he'd be picked apart and there'd be scrutiny and people would ask questions. And he doesn't want to do that. And he's a coward. That's why he never went there. Because if he didn't have any of those other facets at play, if there weren't any other thing. This isn't a vacuum. You just say to Fauci, Fauci, would you like to go on a highly rated network or a lowly rated network? He would go, I'll go on the high rated network. And would you like to talk to the most people who are unvaccinated or people who have already been vaccinated? And he would go, well, of course, I'd like to talk to the unvaccinated. I want to make my case. Well, then go on Fox. Never showed up on Fox. Why? Mm. Right. 
I, if memory serves, he went on Cavuto once or twice, but that's like, for, with respect to Neil, one of the lowest rated shows they have. And they weren't particularly challenging. And it was a very different interview than he would have gotten from any of the primetime hosts. If he's so smart, why can't he take it? Why couldn't he do it? And we all know the answer. Same reason, Dr. Well, What's her name? He's never going to come on here. He's, and, yeah, he's lying. Listen to me. I have an expertise. I'm an expert. I have an expertise in carpentry. That was my business. That's my field of expertise. Um, if you'd like me to come on your show and we're going to debate carpentry, I would say, fine, bring it on. That's that's my field of expertise. I don't. Oh, but what about unfair questions or not getting a fair shake or be, or uh, being ambushed? I'd be like, you can't ambush me. I'm a journeyman carpenter. We can talk about all things carpentry. How would you ambush mm -hmm. me? And I would say the same about Fauci. You are the science. You're an epidemiologist. You've been doing this for 50 years. How could you be torpedoed or ambushed by Sean Hannity? He's I totally not a agree with this. I've said this before. We asked Fauci many times to come on this show and we were rejected. Like I, like I could ever know the amount he knows about virology, though I would be prepared. And he knows that, right? So he's afraid. But I'll put it in terms that the average person at home can understand. I always say this, if you're gonna go public speak about something, you're gonna get interviewed about something, make yourself an expert and then the nerves go away because there's nothing, as you're pointing out, the person can ask you that you're worried about. Think about your son. Think about your daughter. If somebody wanted to interview about them, you'd be on fire. You'd know everything about them. There's nothing the interviewer knows that you don't know. It would be a spicy, fun interview and you'd feel totally relaxed doing it. It's only when you haven't done your homework that you feel uncomfortable or when you're being dishonest, which was Fauci's whole game. I got to take a quick break. There's, we have got to get to the woman on the plane who had the meltdown, allegedly about a lizard person. That was my theory. She's now speaking out again, and I've got a lot of thoughts on this, plus the CEO of Target addresses their tuck it bathing suits with some revisionist history of his own. Freelance work is booming. So many people are taking the leap and starting their own business, but how do you maximize your earnings, minimize your taxes, and make sure you are legally compliant? It can be overwhelming, confusing, and it takes time away from your own billable hours. That's where the experts at collective.com come in. Now, Collective was built specifically for businesses of one that are making over 60,000 in profit a year. Collective handles all of your back office work so you can focus on your passion and not your paperwork. And they can tell you how they can backdate your S Corp and save you thousands on taxes this year. They handle business formation and compliance paperwork, taxes, bookkeeping, accounting, and even payroll. Check out collective.com slash Megan to potentially save thousands of dollars on your taxes. To sweeten the deal, they will also throw in an extra $100 off when you use my link. That's collective.com slash Megan to get started with your personal team of self-employed tax experts. So Adam, I have a great update for you. Very interesting. You remember the lady who freaked out on the plane and she was like, I am not staying on this plane and you can stay or you can go, but we're not gonna make it to Orlando. Her name is Tiffany Gomez. And she was eventually tracked down by TMZ among others. And she just gave an interview. She was caught on camera for a bit, I think by either by, the, by TMZ or the Daily Mail and gave like a little comment one time, but this is her first interview about what happened. She went out, it's a Barstool Sports uh, podcast called uh, pardon my take. And here is how she is now explaining her meltdown on that plane. You know, the reason why I probably haven't come out yet, because it's like so cringe. Um, I did not see anything. What? I mean, I think y'all knew that. Okay. <laughs> I We honestly had no idea. Yeah. You said you did. No, I did not. The Those media. You said this motherfucker that, is not real. I said that motherfucker is not, not real. These. Or okay. Did, like. Apologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I <laughs> got in a bit of an altercation. It spiraled out of control. It was not my best moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's actually a horrible moment. It's absolutely mortifying. So what you're saying is that clip that we all saw, that motherfucker's not real, is not like you thinking that someone is an alien. It was just the tail end of an argument. It was an expression of speech. Okay. Like, That's was it like crazy. an armrest? Like you guys are fighting yeah, over the armrest? Yeah, what was the fight over? So gave up. I was in the middle seat, and it was just... There was just a really bad energy, and I don't want to get into like all the details of that. Okay, once again, 
in my opinion, everything she just said was a lie. It was all lies. That's my opinion because, and it was just an expression of speech. It was just an expression. It was just like a turn of phrase. Here is what happened on board that plane. I'm telling you, I'm getting the f off, and there's a reason why I'm getting the f off, and everyone can either believe it or they cannot believe it. I don't give two f but I am telling you right now, that mother f that mother f back there is not real. And you can sit on this plane and you can f die with them or not. I'm not going to. Then there was part two in the airport, once they had to turn the plane back around and bring it back to the terminal thanks to her freak out, where she wouldn't leave the terminal, she was trying to film the plane, and here's what happened there. Hey, that plane leave. Do not let that plane leave. Being dead serious, do not let that plane leave. That flight's not gonna make it to Orlando. That flight's not gonna make it to Orlando. And the whole video, if you watch the full five minute meltdown, which some lovely passenger filmed, began with her saying, I need to get the F off this plane. I need to get the F off this plane. I don't give an F about my shit. I just need to get the F off this plane. I'm getting the F off. And then she says, because there is, there is a stupid effing dude over here, no. And then comes, everyone can believe it or not believe it. I don't give two Fs. That M effer back there is not real. Now. No one actually cares about this woman or this controversy whatsoever. It's just in good fun. But she's out there, and God bless those guys at Pardon My Take who managed to like, oh, really, kind of keep it going. This woman is like trying to spin herself into now like a self-help guru who is going to help us all, I guess, with our, what to me is an obvious lizard people take of shapeshifter take. That is 100% what I believe Tiffany was seeing or purporting to see on the plane. It's not real. But she's one of the people, and this is why it's interesting, who I believe gets sucked in to the lunacy that's all over the internet about this narrative, shape-shifting lizard people. She's lost her grip with reality. I'm sorry, she's having a mental health issue, obviously, hearts and prayers. However, um, what she said to those guys is not true. It doesn't match up with the facts. What do you make of it? I agree with that. Also, it's kind of curious. Her name is Tiffany Gomez. So she has the whitest name and the most Mexican name. And she <laughs> made like a Reese's peanut butter cup out of it. And there's not another human being on the planet named Tiffany and Gomez. Um, there's a lot of Dolores Gomez's and there's a lot of Tiffany Wilson's, but there's no Tiffany Gomez's out there. So she's got range culturally. Um, she seems possessed. And I think there's a lot of people, here's my theory. There's a lot of people who don't fly without ingesting a few things, some edibles, some micro dosing, although her micro dosing could have turned into a mega dosing. So I feel like she was rolling on something when she was in that airplane. There's just a lot of people that ingest things before they get on that flight. and. That, to me, I think may be the culprit. I don't believe that. I think, because I think that would have been an easy thing to say, I'm such a dumbass. You know, I took something because I'm a nervous flyer and it had a bad effect on me. That's, everybody been like, oh, poor thing. We would have been skeptical, but it like at least would have made sense. She lives in a million dollar home. She's got a nice job from what I hear. And I think like, I watched this documentary. I talked about this over the summer, once again, with the Ruthless guys. And- um, we, I was talking about this documentary called The Devil You Know, which I think was Amazon Prime season two. Amazing, amazing documentary about how people get sucked into, there are like a lot of people, Adam, who believe that there are lizard people among us, that there are quote, shape shifters among us. And it's very rare that you see them out themselves publicly, but I believe that's what happened on that airplane. Here's a clip from that documentary, which was about in part this radio broadcaster, Sherry Schreiner, who pushed the nonsense to thousands of people who bought it. But here's, watch this. The reptilians have been dominating Earth uh, for the last hundreds of years, thousands. These aliens, they pose as humans so they can destroy the humans on Earth. Like, it's freaky to me to think this woman's in a top tier marketing job, I believe it is. 
has success in life, she could be sitting next to her on the airplane and she's looking around for the lizard people. This is what, this is the dark side of the internet. This is the dark side of no longer believing in the CDC, the WHO, the FBI, the DOJ, the court system, the cops, the presidency, the State Department, all of which are valid. I understand the skepticism about all those groups and share in it. But you start to go down this rabbit hole and for, for too many, there's no bottom to it. You, the next thing you know, you're on a plane seeing lizard people. That's my belief about what really went down. No, I agree. I think the most insidious, damaging chapter from what that we just passed through is opening the window to skepticism for everything. And I used to make fun of conspiracy theorists all the time. I really can't anymore after what we just passed through and what we saw the FBI and the CDC and the WHO and all these different authorities and entities, what they've done to us, and then also mixed in with the crazed revisionist history of Gavin Newsom explaining California was great. He didn't really lock everyone in their homes. It, it leaves the window open to keep going down a conspiracy theory path. Now, I'm not gonna keep going down that path. I'm not a flat earther or the Jews took down the Twin Towers or any of that, but it does open the window. And this is the problem. The problem is, is you know, when there's some shooting in Nashville and they will not release the manifesto, then it makes everyone go, well, what was really going on with that? or when they won't give you the information or the data, the statistics, or they lie to you, you start going, what the heck's going on there? And people that are less pragmatic than you and I go much further down that path. Mm -hmm. I just think like it, and I realize there've been, you know, sort of little screw loose people from the dawn of time. I've talked about before on the show, how there's this very weird internet conspiracy theory around that I am Nicole Brown Simpson, like, somehow reincarnated, but I don't know how that works because I existed at the same time that Nicole Brown Simpson was alive. So I'm not sure how they square those two things, but it's, if you Google it, you'll see a bunch of things pop up. So it's not like this is new or just post COVID and the deterioration, deterioration in the trust of our industries, um, but it's gotten worse for sure. And I think those COVID lockdowns that Gavin Newsom was responsible for in part added to it. I think a lot of people are having mental health breaks. There's not enough services to help them. Uh, and I actually, for one, wish that Tiffany Gomez would come out and just tell the truth because it's very clear to me she's not. All right, let me get to the last thing, Target. You know, Target was having its Tucket female swimsuits on display during Pride Month in June. And people all over the country got ticked off. It was annoying. I don't want to have to explain why the F there's a Tucket swimsuit sitting on display to my kid. And I was not alone. So he gives his interview to Becky Quick of CNBC. And first he tries to say the backlash he faced here was worse than what Target experienced post George Floyd, when there was open looting and destruction of targets. Listen to this, that one. You know, I've seen natural disasters. We've seen the impact of COVID leading into the pandemic. Some of the violence that took place after George Floyd's murder. But I would tell you, Becky, what I saw back in May is the first time since I've been in this job, where I had store team members saying, it's not safe to come to work. Well, these are people who did not like that you had Pride merchandise that was out, and they came in and they said what? Well, <clears throat> they were very, again, aggressive with our team members. Doing what? Personally saying, threatening yelling at them? them? Yelling at them. You know, they threatened to light product on fire. In know, the store. In the store. So, you know, very aggressive behavior. I mean, we've been celebrating heritage moments like Pride for over a decade now. We've never seen that kind of response. You didn't put a Tucket bathing suit in your stores until this year. And here's what right. he says, which is a lie about that. Watch. Um, people said, look, there are bathing suits that are transgender bathing suits that are being targeted and marketed to kids. Uh, there is a, a, a guy who you're working with, a designer who, uh, I, you know, I don't know, it was a devil worshiper with some of the things. What, what did you find? What would you say back to some of those criticisms? Well, I think you and I both know those weren't true. But in the moment, <laughs> we said the best thing for us to do is address the issue. We can't 
combat each and every statement that's being made. Lies. All lies, Adam. Yeah. Well, first off, you always know where these guys are politically when they say George Floyd murder. You know where they're coming from mm -hmm. and when they say insurrection. But here's what I want to say to these pussies. OK, it was worse than <laughs> the summer of looting and crime and BLM. How many of your employees were injured? How much product was damaged? How many stores were burned? How many shelves were knocked over? Tell me. Oh, you had employees that felt threatened. Everyone feels threatened now, you pussy. What are we talking about? Give me numbers, body count. Who was killed? Who went to the hospital? Who was injured? Show me some pictures. What do you have? Yeah, exactly. And here, just as a fact check, a kid's black swim skirt had a tag reading, thoughtfully fit on multiple body types and gender expressions. For kids, that's what he did. And as for his designer, there was a guy, he was 100% working with him. It went under the brand name Ab Pralin, a brand out of the UK headed by a self-proclaimed gay transgender man known as Eric. And he included images on some of his other merchandise, not that sold at Target, but this guy was indeed a devil promoter. Pentagrams, horn skulls, references to devils, quote, Satan respects pronouns was on some of his designs. And Eric wrote on Instagram last year, being called a demon is something I can cope with. And the idea of a trans demon is pretty damn cool. Most of my work focuses on Gothic or dark or satanic imagery. That's his partner in coming up with the tuck friendly, et cetera, merchandise at Target. So he lied. He was working with somebody who's into devil worship very publicly. He did put out trans clothing for children and he's a liar. It was definitely not worse than post George Floyd when a Minneapolis Target store was destroyed by looting in the wake of the George Floyd situation. Adam Carolla, you're the, you're the best, you're the greatest. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thank you. All right, let's see you soon. We'll talk to all of you soon. Thanks for being so with us this week and every week and we'll talk more on Monday.